problem in philosophy. How does our consciousness relate to the physical world, and specifically, how does it relate to the brain? First of all, we have to do what philosophers love to do, give a definition of consciousness. <laughs> and we're always told consciousness is hard to define. Uh, I think it's kind of easy to define if we're just talking about a common sense definition that identifies what we're talking about. We're not ready for a scientific definition. We don't know enough of the science of the brain to give that. But as a common sense definition of consciousness, here it is. Consciousness consists of all of those states of feeling or sentience or awareness. Uh, they begin when we wake up in the morning from a dreamless sleep and they go on all day until we fall asleep uh, or get hit over the head or die or otherwise become unconscious. <laughs> And on this definition, dreams are a form of consciousness, different from waking consciousness, but all the same forms of consciousness. Now, if you take that as your definition, then there are some remarkable features of consciousness. One, for every conscious state, there's something that it feels like to be in that state. There's a certain qualitative character uh, to conscious states. Uh, and you know that if you think about the difference between, let's say, drinking water <laughs> and drinking beer. Uh, this is not beer, by the way. Uh, or listening to music or any other kind of conscious states. Uh, and uh, these can be as involved as you like. Uh, pick your favorite. If you enjoy feeling the angst of post-industrial man under late capitalism, well, that is a conscious state like drinking water or drinking beer. For every conscious state, there's something that it feels like to be in that state. Now that's our first feature, the qualitative character of consciousness. But now the second feature of consciousness that really follows from that is that consciousness is different from, let's say, uh, uh, the weight of an object uh, because it has this characteristic of subjectivity. It only exists insofar as it's experienced by a subject. And I'll have more to say about that later. So qualitativeness and subjectivity are essential features of consciousness. And a third feature that really follows from them is that all of our conscious states come to us as part of a unified conscious field. So I don't just hear the sound of my voice and feel the weight of my body against my shoes, but I have all of that as part of a single unified conscious field. And that's a stunning fact. That's what gives consciousness its enormous power in relating us to the world, is we have all of our experiences as part of a single, continuous, unified conscious field. Uh, well, that's three features. Let me mention a couple more before we get into the harder philosophical parts. Another feature of consciousness that's commonly denied is it functions causally. Consciousness functions causally and whenever I have any doubts about it, I just do the following. I decide to raise my arm, and the damn thing goes up. It's not, there's no question that my consciousness caused my arm to go up. This is routinely denied by otherwise respectable philosophers, but you can get a sore arm by refuting them just by demonstrating that your consciousness can cause bodily movements. Okay, now a fifth a feature of consciousness, and this is remarkable, and I won't have time to develop it, is our conscious states relate us to objects and states of affairs in the world. So I'm busy thinking about the plane I'm going to catch tomorrow, and my income tax, and my students in Berkeley, uh, and my large dog at home, and who's taking care of him, and all these things. This is a feature that has a name. It's called intentionality. So this feature of intentionality is a fifth feature. Let me identify the sixth and that's the most important. Consciousness is irreducible. You can't get rid of it. You see, some people say, well look, science has showed us that sunsets don't really exist, it's an illusion. Rainbows don't really exist, it's an illusion. Why couldn't we show that consciousness is an illusion? The same way, couldn't we get rid of it by showing that it's just an illusion? Here is the problem. The illusion-reality distinction is a distinction between how things consciously seem to us and how they really are. But where the very existence of consciousness is concerned, you can't make the illusion reality distinction 
because if you have the illusion that you are conscious, you are conscious. Uh, that's all you need for consciousness. Now, you can be mistaken about the details. Uh, you thought you had fallen in love, but, you know, you had a lot to drink, and she looked good in that light, and they were playing that <laughs> Italian music that they like to play. Okay, so you were mistaken about the details, but the fa very fact of your consciousness, you cannot be mistaken about that. Descartes was right about that, because if you have the conscious illusion that you are conscious, you are conscious. That's all that you need. So the traditional illusion reality distinction does not work for consciousness. Okay, that's all.